And joining the Fred Minnick Show, uh, coming in on the Beeline Hotline, go to findyoursippingpoint.com to go check out all the bars in northern Kentucky. The great, the one, the only, Wright Thompson, author of Pappy Land. How you doing, sir? Man, I'm doing great. I uh, uh, It's weird to be talking to you in the morning. I associate you with the nighttime, so this is... Uh, uh, I think this is not either of our natural habitats. Well, you're 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 making a good point. If you take a look at my outfit, uh, I am not in the the normal bourbon drinking attire. There's no ascot. I got a hat on, no suit jacket, uh, and I'm drinking coffee, not bourbon. <laughs> oh man! So you you uh you've got you've got an amazing book coming out, and of course, uh, you know you're. Your sports writing is legendary, and I was so excited to see your talent come into come into bourbon. Like to me, like this is a as someone who's been writing about bourbon for 15 years, and you know, try to treat it a little bit like sports writing. Uh, you coming in and bringing you know your level of writing to me, this is a big moment for bourbon that you that you joined us in this great world of the brown. Well, you know, I, I, that's very, very kind of you. I, uh, I certainly, you know, I've always been a bourbon drinker, but I mean, I didn't know a ton about it till I started this. And so for me, it's been in addition to the journey of getting to know Julian and write the book, it's also been interesting to sort of see that this community exists out there. And, uh, you know, I've learned a ton and I, I don't, I just think it's, I think bourbon fans know more about bourbon than say football fans know about what their offense is actually doing on the field and like that level of knowledge i mean it's really cool but it's also sort of scary when you're writing about it because you know this is a crowd of people who know what they're talking about mm -hmm. and it's it, it's really cool like that people go do that much work to acquire that much knowledge yeah it is kind of fascinating in fact you'll find that there's a lot of consumers out there who you know, no more than the distillers uh, in terms of history and everything, not necessarily how to make the whiskey. Of course. Yeah. And, you know, and it's funny to be on a tour and see these tour guides uh, give some wrong information because someone's always like, oh, actually, that's incorrect there, sir. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what what made you get into bourbon? What was what was the how did you get come about to write Pappy Land? Well, I mean, uh I got into bourbon because I grew up in Mississippi and it was what we stole from our fathers. I mean, and so I, it, it was always the drink of choice. Uh, uh, the book came about, it was interesting. I mean, I, it, it started out, uh, my agent was just like, you should write just about an ode to bourbon and go hang out with Julian Van Winkle. And uh, I started hanging out with him and it quickly became apparent to me that the story needed to be both about the thing that I never knew about Pappy, which was that it was both a reflection of a deep family history, but also something that Julian and his dad had to build back up after the family lost its Weller. But it was also a story about the, it was a story about writing a book as much as anything about the process of getting to be friends with Julian. And you know, there was a lot going on in my life. And I found that my conversations with him about bourbon were actually incredibly relevant to the things that were happening in my life. And I just decided at that point, as opposed to just writing a book about bourbon or about Julian, it was going to be this weird mm -hmm. hybrid of the Pappy Van Winkle story with my own experience of writing the book. And so those things are wound together, hopefully in an interesting way, but it, it felt like the only way to really do it. You know, you did, you actually went very personal um, yeah. in a lot of the book. So, um, you know, what what was that like to because your your writing always touches people very deeply and, and in a personal way um you know what am one of my favorite stories you ever have ever written is the guy who killed the tree you know and you, yeah. you got you got us all relate to the tree killer guy you know <laughs> oh dude harvey updike man he just died uh oh. yeah i uh, know i uh i sent his son a note it's just like look i know people have a lot of opinions about your father but he was always gentle and lovely with me. Uh, he, uh, it, it was very exposing. I mean, it's interesting. I'm used to writing other people's stuff, not mm -hmm. my own stuff. Exactly. Uh, I sort of felt like it wasn't fair for me to ask Julian to go some of the places that he goes if I wasn't willing to do it too. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, on a certain level, like I just, the thing has to be true to the moment. And if I wasn't being honest with readers about the things my time in the world of birds, I felt like that was disingenuous. And I don't know how they know, but readers know if you're pulling punches. I mean, you write a lot. You know, I mean, people know. Yeah. Did you, when you were, when you were going in to write this, did you have, and, and you knew, obviously everybody knows about Pappy Van Winkle being like this totally uh, sought after, hyped up bourbon. Did you go in like thinking that, you know, you were going to dislike it or you were going to, you know, did you have any preconceived notions of what Pappy Van Winkle was going in? I mean, I'd had it a few times and, you know, I'm, I don't have your palate. So sometimes it's hard for me to separate my expectations of what something is going to be with what it is. And I find that those two things get intertwined in a way that, you know, I don't know if I have a complex enough whiskey palate to separate my desire for something to be great from its actual greatness. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was interesting is, I mean, I drank a lot of really good whiskey doing this book. And it was interesting how unsentimental Julian was about it. I mean, we drank some really old whiskey that was really, really good. And then we drank some really old whiskey that I'd be super fired up about. And he would just smell it and be like, ah, it's oxidized. Yeah. And like, so, so it was interesting to see, to try to, to have my own sort of ideas about myth and expectations broken by him. I thought that was, I don't know if, Alanis Morissette might call it ironic. I don't think it actually is ironic, but uh, uh, it was really interesting to see how uh, unsentimental he was about it. And one of the things, too, that, uh, you know, Julian, a lot of people don't know the hardships, you know, Julian went through, you know, to get here to what Pappy is today. And a lot of people always want to associate, well, like, well, we can't get a bottle. So they go toward just naturally hating Julian yeah. and Pappy Van Winkle. What did you find, you know, how did, how did, um, how did Julian handle, you know, those kinds of situations where, you know, they're not exactly the most popular people in, in the room when it comes to, to whiskey geeks because everyone's so mad they can't get a product. It was interesting. Uh, one, there's, you know, they're certainly aware that that exists. Uh, I guess kids get madder about it than he does. You know, I think he sort of understands, look, you know, he's been in this business a very long time and is a big boy and he understands sort of what comes with it. He's seen it up close for, you know, he's in the third generation of this watching the fourth. And, uh, I, I, I know that like, I mean, I've been there on allocation day you know, and I know how frustrating it is because all he wants in the world is for everyone to be able to have old rip in their decanter, mm. you know, like, and so that, yeah, there's deep frustration that there just isn't any more of it. Uh, I mean, I imagined sort of that there might be some huge secret supply, you know, I was like, sweet, I'm, I'm getting inside the Thunderdome, but it does, it, there isn't, you know, his sons-in-law, uh, we got some uh, we got some Van Winkle out because there was a CBS crew there, and his sons in law were making jokes like, "Oh my God, Julian's getting Van Winkle out!" Like, what's what's the special occasion? So, uh, I mean, it that was really interesting to see that the scarcity is real. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people just don't believe it. You know, they think it's uh, it's hyped up. I, I can understand that. I mean, you know, I, I certainly thought, well, this guy's got a basement full of this stuff, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, he doesn't. There is some cool stuff in the basement. Uh, they had a like one of those little, ta- you know, I mean, like the tasting bottles from the 70s of mm-hmm. uh, like 1971, 72 White Dog off the Stitzel Well or still. And it's smoother than some of the stuff that's aged. I mean, it was like, oh, I was like, oh, I could, you know, this is what Junior Johnson was driving around. Yeah, I could I could get behind that. Well, it's funny, like when they when they shut down operations in 1992, the 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 crew has purposely left some still in the system so i got to taste i got to taste uh some of that from uh from the 90s not the 70s but you're right that stuff was that stuff was amazing and of course when we talk about pappy we do have to talk about stitzel weller and 
you know, it's it's kind of depressing for for Julian to think about Stitzel Weller. Well, it, they associate it with so many good and then lost memories. I mean, I don't know if you've ever. I mean, Julian and his sister Sally. Uh, I don't know Kitty that well, but I mean, I do know Julian and Sally really well, and it's deeply personal for them to be out there because, you know, the memory of his grandfather and his father, frankly, is associated with that place, not out like at Cave Hill Cemetery where they're buried. And so I think it, it, it the, the right word when they go back there is communion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and Frank, that's, you know, all he wants in the world is to drink Stutzel Weller bourbon or to put out into the world the closest approximation that he thinks can that can be made of that particular taste. It was interesting to me to see how much of the process for him is sort of dancing with the ghost of that and like how ever present that is in the tasting room and in his mind when they're doing it. You know, when he was 16, 17, he was working out there and there was something that happened with the barrel and he got drenched in this Thistle Weller whiskey, like a, you know, a half bear, whatever it was, just gallons covering him and he said like he felt like the whiskey was almost like inside of him and he could still smell like he remembers that so clearly of being like surrounded by the smell and the taste of that Stitzel Weller and I mean almost everything they do on some level is influenced by that memory and like I thought that I found that really interesting wow that is that is really uh unique you know I when Sally first went back to Stitzel Weller, they, there was like a uh, there. Diageo was doing some kind of ceremony. I don't even remember what it was for. Op- the opening of a visitor center or something. Yeah. Uh, but I, I was there with Sally, and you know she had tears coming down her eyes, and hmm. uh, you know. No, it's real. It's it's very real, and uh, I don't. Yeah. I, and and I think I think that's just like. I think that's something that your book does. And if you all, you know, you can go to Amazon or, or actually talk about, talk a little bit about where we're, where you, cause you've got a promo going on with, uh, with this book to, 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 for like a, for, to get whiskey, to get Pappy. Yeah. I mean, so what we wanted to do is, uh, uh, have a chance for people to get it. And, you know, cause it's so hard to get, which is endlessly the whiskey, frustrating. The, the whiskey. The whiskey. Yeah. And so we are doing, uh, we have three events, uh, September 12th, 14th, and 16th. They're on the line. You can go to rightthompson.com and it'll be there. Uh, and w- there are three separate bookstores who are holding virtual events. And we are raffling off three bottles at each event. A bottle of Old Rip, which I just dearly love. Uh, I might buy copies of my own book to try to win it. Uh, a, uh, but a bottle of Old Rip, a bottle of 15, and a bottle of 20. And uh, just excited for uh, excited for people to get those. I mean, I did this thing on the Dan Patrick Show uh, a couple of months ago where I said, you know, just send me a note about who you would drink a bottle with and why. And whichever one I find most moving, I'll send the bottle. So I got the bottle upstairs. I'm about to send uh, was a Marine officer. His name's Ted Hubbard. And... Mm. He told me he would drink the bottle with the father of one of his men who was killed in Afghanistan. Uh, the, mm. so, the Marine, don't call him a soldier. The yeah. Marine's name was Seth Sharp. And so like the exciting part about being out here talking about the book is being able to give some of this whiskey to people. So I'm hoping folks will come to the event and Julian and I are going to talk and he's going to answer questions, ask him anything. It's I love to see him on the spot. It's great. <laughs> and uh he uh making a donation to the Lee Initiative. Uh it's a restaurant workers relief fund. It's a really good cause. Uh and uh you get a signed book and then you get a shot to win some whiskey. And so we are uh I don't know, I'm really excited. Hope we get some big crowds. Yeah, I think you will and uh, uh socially distance and COVID safe crowds, of course. But this is uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, you know whiskey fans everywhere get really really excited about. But I think that you know you know uh, the that's one part of like what's going on. But I think the most important thing that your book does is it humanizes Julian Van Winkle. And over the years, I've tried to do that on the stage, and I've tried to like have him on events and podcasts and everything. But your writing does it in a way that you know all of his haters out there 
if if you don't come away from this book and love Julian Van Winkle, then I I, I can't do anything for you <laughs> because. Well, I'm- I mean, they were lovely, and you know, and and, and it's you know, it's interesting. Uh, in, by the way, someone has a really good faker out there because they are, are. Someone has one of the Buffalo Trace capping machines. Yeah, yeah. Because because some of the fakes, oh, if fakes get discovered, they get sent to Buffalo Trace, mm-hmm. and Julian tastes them. So it's always pretty funny to see him tasting what people are passing off as pappy, because every now and then it'd be like sometimes you like. Well, that whatever is in there is really good. <laughs> like, but it's not, you know, he, he, because it is such a sort of memory quest for him, it really upsets them. There are things out there pretending to be Pappy. I mean, it's interesting. He cares more than I think I would care if I were running it. Right. That, that, he, that it's after he's after a thing. And I, I don't know. I found that really, really interesting. Well, uh, it's also like, you know, they were, I had them on stage at Bourbon and Beyond, which is our big uh, music yeah, festival course. that got canceled this year. And, you know, one of the things that Preston brought up in on the panel was that they had lawyers and that they worked with Facebook to basically take down the secondary market. And that But was, that went over well. That, that kind of like sent some ripples through the, through the bourbon world a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's about the only way to get it. And, uh, you know, the idea that some of it isn't real, I think, is deeply personal to Julian. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it it's interesting to see when you're writing a book about someone, you get permission to ask them things that you would never ask even your closest friend. I mean, I just one time I just was like, Julian, do you believe in God? You know, like, I mean, they, like I, I could ask him anything. I asked him mm-hmm. all sorts of questions about his father, who was a, a, a great but at times difficult man. You know, Julian's really, really, really shy. Like, as he sort of learned how to play the character of Julian Van Winkle over the years, his kids love to sort of laugh. Like, you know, look at this guy. And he, But he's grown. It's really interesting how much more comfortable he is with it now than at the beginning. I mean, now he gets on stage and plays cowbell with bands. Mm-hmm. I mean, that... That was unimaginable to his children when they were coming up. Yeah, we had uh, we did a charity event together, and he he got on the stage and started doing duck calls. And... Yeah, that, that that's is what I mean. I mean, like, <laughs> was he wearing his fake teeth? Uh no, he didn't have his fake teeth there. But no, I the know fake about teeth his are fake good. Teeth. The fake teeth are that's good. Uh, one of his sons in law is an Elvis impersonator, and so one year for Christmas, Julian and Sissy got him. Whoever makes the finest Elvis impersonator outfits, they got him one. And so he regularly performs at family functions. Uh, I mean, you know, their sons-in-law are hilarious. I mean, because, you know, he has triplets. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's just, it's hilarious. I'm getting better at being able to tell who is who uh, from the triplets. I can do it now. Although uh, I confused... uh, uh, Carrie and Chenault the other day. So just when I got cocky, I, I'm, and then boy, they love it when you do that. So that was, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm usually pretty good. I noticed like, like Carrie has a different voice than Chenault. Like, so like I have to like get them to talk in order for me to like <laughs> yeah. separate them. But, but those two are tough. Definitely tough. No, um, hilarious. So again, the book is Pappy Land. You can find it at bookstores everywhere, but there, there is a drawing coming up. Um, with square books that you can get a bottle of, of Pappy. So make sure you're, you're checking that out. Now, when you are looking at covering, covering bourbon, what, what are, what are some similarities to bourbon, uh, to sports? Well, I mean, one, people are very, very passionate about it mm-hmm. and, uh, and have long and deeply felt opinions I mean, down to like, you know, you drink what your father drinks and like what your father liked. You know, I mean, I think one of the reasons I like Van Winkle so much is my dad drank Maker's Mark. You know, and so just that weeded thing was, I mean, when I would steal whiskey, that's what we would steal. Mm. Uh, And so, uh, you know, the thing I wanted to get right in the book was to try to go, to crack it open wide enough to talk about or try to unpack why do we love bourbon so much and why does it carry so many almost mystical qualities beyond a liquid that some human beings make for other human beings to consume. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like why, like, why are we sitting here in the morning talking about it and you've got all those bottles behind you? I mean, it, it does have some sort of hold on us and embodies in some way something about the American spirit. I mean, that sounds highfalutin, but I do think that there, that, that is true. And I wanted it to be a book about why someone makes bourbon and why someone likes to drink it. Mm. And so winding, I mean, ultimately at its simplest level, it is the story of someone who makes it Julian and someone who drinks it me. Mm. And, you know, I like that those things were talking to each other. And I mean, you know, I hope, you know, in my heart of hearts that maybe I've articulated something that a lot of people like you and I who drink bourbon or like to talk and think about it have felt, but never fully articulated. Mm. Like, I, I think that as a, like, I think people will say, Oh, that's me on the page. Hopefully. Yeah. And there is a little bit of uh, despair too. Like, you know, I mean, you're an old miss fan. Like that is, I'm, I can't imagine the pain you've been through over the years. I'm an Oklahoma state fan. So <laughs> I, I've got a little bit of similarities, but at least we've win in wrestling. Uh, <laughs> It's tough being an old Miss fan. Dude, I mean, come on. I mean, you know, uh, one Sugar Bowl, like, you know, one Sugar Bowl in my lifetime. Yeah. It's, so. yeah. But when you look at like that pain of a sports fan, we don't really have that as much in, in bourbon. We don't, unless you want to take a look at like, I really want a bottle, but I can't get it. You know, but there, that's the one thing that I can think that might be a little different. It's like, Bourbon's largely joy. I think oh, yeah. being being a fan's mostly heartache. <laughs> but also, you know, but bourbon might be its most effective during times of despair. So maybe they're related in that way. <laughs> That's right. You, you know, I mean, it's a thing. It, you reach for it at weddings, and you reach for it at wakes. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's to me, bourbon always, you know, circle of life stuff. You know. So now that you've gotten the 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 bug, uh, have you found yourself like, uh, you know, seeking out bottles, or are you just staying in that weeded bourbon uh, profile? I sort of just stay in that profile. I mean, I've got some stuff. Uh, you know, uh, I went on my internet kick looking for you know very very old Fitzgerald, you know, for a while and bought a couple of those. But I mean, you know, the, I just can't justify the money. Uh, so, I mean, I have a, de- I have a decanter that always has maker's mark in it mm-hmm. and I have some really nice bottles of stuff that, I mean, I open regularly for, to, as a way of saying to someone you matter, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I don't have like a big, when I get it, I drink it. You know I mean? If there, if I have a bottle of Van Winkle, it is open on the bar. Yeah. Uh, and so like, you know, I, but I do sort of stick with what I like. And I make a lot of cocktails. So if I'm making a Boulevardier or an old fashioned, you know, I mean, it's just decanter whiskey. I mean, that's what I was saying earlier. I mean, I would love a world in which everyone's decanter whiskey was old rip mm. for you know, $60 a bottle. What are the, what are the things that you, um, that you talk about in, in the book? I think I'll surprise a lot of people, but it's a compliment to, to red breast is how much, uh, Julian Van Winkle loves, uh, red breast uh, Irish whiskey. Mm-hmm. He loves red breast. And I mean, if you're having dinner, their place in Michigan or their house in Kentucky or out with Julian, you know, if he's had a great dinner, he will get red breast on the rocks with a twist. And like, that's his going to his happy place. You know, the last drink of the night, I feel like often with him is that. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's, uh, and it's amazing because that is like, everybody's like, I don't know a single bourbon drinker who doesn't like that one. Like if you, if they get introduced to red breast, 12 or 15, 21 year old, if you're lucky. Um, I think the 27 year old might be a little tougher for some folks, but it's, it's such a good whiskey. It's really good. Also Bruce Springsteen's favorite whiskey. Well, there you go. I got to get, go. get Bruce Springsteen on the show and drink some. Boy, really nice that would be, we've him. got a record coming out. You actually probably could do it. That would be the coup of all coups, man. If I could get Bruce Springsteen, I would just, Drop the mic, you know, you walk away. The sunset, you know. What's there like, left to do? <laughs> I'll do like Jared Allen and ride a, right off in the sunset with my horse. <laughs> yeah, no, hundred percent. I'm done. Of course, I'd probably fall off the horse, and you know, probably have to go drink a pint of bourbon to, you know, cope with the pain. Oh, is that why they call it falling off the wagon? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to see this wagon. 
<laughs> so you, you obviously got a really good insight into the Van Winkle family and everybody's always like wanting more, wanting something else. Did you get any kind of insight that we might see a new product or a different line coming out in the next uh, few years? I desperately wanted that because that would have been nice in the book, but I didn't. I mean, one of the things I find really impressive about them and like I've seen it, you know, I've seen it up close is Julian is slow and steady wins the race. Mm -hmm. Like he doesn't just assume because people are bourbon crazy now that they will always be. And mm -hmm. like his family has ridden these waves. And I think in some part of his mind, his experience and long history in the whiskey business makes him cautious. So like they don't do anything crazy. I mean, it's, it's very, let's do it. Like we've always done it. Let's just make sure that we like what's in the bottle and that, you know, I expected them to be, frankly, trying to figure out every single possible way to monetize it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that wasn't the case. Yeah, I mean, they could, you know, obviously the, the sisters have Papico, which is a which yeah. is a retail outlet. There's 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 some things happening there. Correct. Uh, and they really when we had them on the stage of Bourbon and Beyond, they were they were kind of got in the Preston and the sisters or Carrie kind of got in a little scuffle about like coming out with a tequila. <laughs> oh, that'll, I mean, uh, you know, she really I'll wants a tequila. <laughs> yeah. I don't really see that happening. Uh, uh, it, it's funny. I mean, you know, the, the Pappy and co will end up being more successful than the whiskey because there just is a limit on how much there is. Right. You can't sell more than more, you know? I mean, it's interesting. Like they, it's, they are at capacity. And they're also, you know, they've got a good partnership with uh, Buffalo Trace, yeah. but Buffalo Trace also has brands they want to take care of. So, and Julian is the majority owner of uh, Pappy Van Winkle or in the in Old Rip Van Winkle. But, uh, you know, I think I, I, I think that, that that partnership is is the best that he can possibly have uh, in Kentucky, but it's still a partnership and, and you know, well, and yeah, I mean, this is, these are huge, huge businesses. I mean, that's what's interesting, too, is like, you know, it was eye-opening to realize how much about selling bourbon is math mm. and, and chemistry. You know, it was, those are big-time industrial spaces, and they look rural, but when you get in them, I mean, those are factories. That's right. And then uh, when the barrels in the warehouse, they start slipping away the angels angels get their share oh, i know it's it's really just like when you see them empty you know it goes in what 53 gallons and comes out six yeah you're just like oh because you know you're paying how does that work but they they pay taxes on the 53 they put in uh they well so they pay they pay tax it's called an ad valorem tax uh um, yeah they they pay it while it's uh in in the barrel and it's basically an estimate they they have a they have a an equation that is basically estimates like what they have have to pay, uh, but back uh, and, and then they they used to have uh, gaugers you know that yeah. would you know check the barrel, um, but it's um, it's basically like a, a property tax and it's it there's a there's a really crazy equation uh, that goes with it but that's what I mean the math yeah. I can't do the math. <laughs> It's, it's, it's crazy. And then all, I, I think one of the other things is like the projections that they have to do. Yeah. Uh, and I, I would hate, I would hate to be the guy in charge of projecting Van Winkle uh, supply and demand. Well, I was there the day this last year when they found out that there wasn't nearly as much of the 20 and 23 as they had hoped. And like, that's real. I mean, he gets an email where it's like, oh, not like, you know, I mean, sitting around the house, ding, phone, and it's an email from the folks at the, in the warehouses where, yeah, actually it evaporated more than we thought. Wow. And so, I mean, that's, it's just wild when something that serious gets delivered via email. Yeah. I don't know why I thought there should be a guy knocking on the door with an envelope. <laughs> Like, yeah, it, it should be like, you know, it, it should be a little bit more formal. Like you have like a guy in a suit, you know. Yeah, yeah, there, there yeah. Knock you. on the door, Mr. Van Winkle, and hand you, you know, he's in a bow tie. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Van Winkle, we're sorry to tell you, but you have yeah. like 
one quarter of the whiskey that you thought you did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that's like, that's a great email. Yeah. Here's a tissue. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I, in my head, it should be like the guy in the tuxedo with the tissue and it should be silk and like, I'm so sorry, sir. Yeah. I'm you sorry, know, sir. The, the letters, the letters on a pillow. <laughs> yeah. Here, here's a complimentary, here, here's a complimentary 1971 Sitzel Weller to soothe you. Yeah. <laughs> Although that would be really nice. I it's mean, a, like, you know, if you've been up to, there's that museum in Louisville that has the Pappy exhibit. Have you been up there? Oh yeah. Frazier. Yeah. The uh, yeah. Frazier. That's great. So, but what's so funny is all that stuff in those cases was in Julian's basement when I started doing this book. Mm. So it was this one night we just went down to his basement and it's just, there's all this priceless whiskey. And I was just like, what, can we just start drinking? Like what's the, <laughs> uh, but it's all over that museum now. It's really, really cool. Yeah, well, that's that. That is something I did want to bring up about Julian. He's got one of the biggest hearts of anybody I've ever met. That man gives so much to charity. It's it's sort of staggering. The bottles they do get. I don't even. It's funny how you know, like you never ask a farmer how much land they have mm -hmm. because you could just do the math and it's really rude. I never asked Julian what, like, how many bottles they got, but every one that they personally get, uh, they give to charity. I think. I mean, I, I don't see them drinking it that much, uh, but no, they auction these bottles off. It's crazy. I've seen them do it. Uh, th it was a church up in the Catholic church up in Michigan where they have a place. They auctioned off a couple of bottles one time when I was up there uh, just for a local benefit and raised, I don't know, $15,000 or something crazy. Like, so they're constantly using them as using them like that. I mean, they just raffle them off. Mm. You know, and they've, um, I've been a part of a lot of charities where they've donated bottles and I've, I've seen them in action and they don't, they don't put out press releases. They don't try to get attention for it. They just do it. No, he did. And again, I mean, Julian, he's really shy. So, I mean, some of it is like wanting to be in the background and some of it is, it's just not his instinct to think, to tell anyone. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's uh no, but they, they sure do. Uh, I mean, I've had a lot more red breast with him than I've had Van Winkle. Well, I I I know that he, he you you had to get a, a bottle or two out of this little deal. What what did you get? Well, I had to, dude. I had to buy some Ooh. because in the book, I like I give some bottles away to people who otherwise wouldn't have been able to get them. Mm -hmm. And now I had to pay for that. That's I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, you joke. No, no, like the. What, whatever I imagine the free whiskey train might be, and believe me, I fantasized greatly about my lifelong free whiskey train where they would show like, like where a case would show up. I take that back. I, he sent me one bottle when my daughter was born, and it's a bottle of ten year old Rip with a handwritten label that s someone calligraphied with her name on it and date of birth and this. But so that was really nice. Uh, what's what's funny is so. We have another baby due in November, and now I got to figure out how I got to call Julian and be like, "Look, man, you're gonna have to do another one of those bottles." <laughs> like I can't explain to these girls why one of them has a has a bottle of Pappy and the other doesn't. So, like, dude, you started it. Now we got to finish it. You know, I mean, that in could fact, be. In fact, this is how I'm telling Julian: I need another bottle for the other kid. <laughs> I mean, this could be a, this could be your strategy. No, this is it. This, I just told him. No, I just told him, Julian. You, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Where's the camera? I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I mean it's. Uh, no, but so what, I mean, no, now I, you just need to have more kids, adopt more, and then you know you get a case eventually. Yeah, cheaper by the dozen. I could get a baseball team. <laughs> uh, no, it's funny. I mean, like you know, so Julian loves to make Van Hattens with Van with his whiskey and his rye, and so like I like to do that when people are over. And I'll make them a Van Hatton. Ex explain to everybody what a Van Hatton is. So a Van Hatton is an uh, uh, ounce and a half of 15-year-old, an uh, ounce and a half of the Van Winkle rye. Uh, I mean, quarter ounce of, of Carpano, uh, a bar spoon of Luxardo cherry juice, uh, and a Luxardo cherry and some blood orange bitters. And that is the Van Hatton, and they are real, real good. And now everybody is all envious because they don't have any of those ingredients. But uh, 
I tell you, I, I want one. No, I mean, they're real, real good. <laughs> like, you know, it's, we always laugh, like, you know, should you put this in a cocktail? But the better the, the better the booze, the better the cocktail. And that is a fine, fine drink. So I guess we'll kind of like, you know, talk a little bit now about like the, the scarcity of it and yeah. and the and the psychology of of like uh, how people feel after they find they can't get a bottle. Because I still can't I still cannot understand why people get so angry over the fact they can't get a bottle. Do you, I mean, do you have any like in, in your like looking at this? Did you? did you come away with like any kind of understanding of the psychology of why people get so deeply disappointed when they can't get a bottle of Van Winkle? Look, I think people, nobody likes, especially with sort of the, today's psychology, nobody likes to be told that they can't do something or they can't have something or that there isn't a way to get it. I think that's some of it. I think, you know, uh, a lot of people flex their bars and, you know, and they want to have that thing sitting up there. Uh, and I think some of the anger is legitimate. And some of it also feels like slightly performative. Like, you know, like when, like the way you hate your opposing football team's coach, mm. like I don't really hate Dan Mullen. You know what I mean? Uh, it's just funny to joke about, uh, you know, it, it, it's, I've been with Julian in public a lot and I've only ever seen one person really get in it about the scarcity. Like we were at one of those whiskey things. This one was in San Francisco, I think. Mm -hmm. And everybody in line was great. I mean, they drank, they drank two bottles of 23 year old in like eight minutes and 41 seconds. Like, like they were poor, they were pouring dreams. Unbelievable how fast they went. But one guy came up and was, you know, he was a liquor store owner who was complaining about his allocation. And Julian was like, call the state of California. I don't pick the stores. Mm. Uh, but that's the only, I've only, I, I was sort of impressed with that guy. Cause I kept waiting. I'm like, where are all these people who have these opinions? Cause I don't ever hear them. And boy, this guy came up there and was wagging his finger. I was like, I almost had some begrudging respect for the guy. Yeah, it is true. People like to go to the keyboard before they go uh, to the in-person commentary. Which I understand. I mean, I, you know, I would talk shit about the rock online, but I wouldn't do it to his face. Now he'd, you know? he'd, he'd straight crush you. Yeah. I mean, I would never. I'd be, yes, sir. Mr. Rock, sir. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, no. yeah. I'm a big University of Miami fan. Huge. Yeah. No, the, the you, baby. <laughs> the you. Yes, sir. Oh, man. Well, you know, I, I look at I, I look at what, you know, Pappy has uh, become. And I look at you like writing this book and I just think it's it's about time uh, that this book gets written. I think it's very important for the, for the history of bourbon. And I'm just so glad that you have entered um, entered the bourbon sphere as you know, you've got you've got the cred as a uh, as a bourbon author now. So it's awesome. I know. Man. I, know. I really appreciate that. I uh, uh, it's been nice because I've been on uh, Penguin said I had to get back on Instagram. And so uh, I've been sort of talking to people in the bourbon community uh, on social media and everybody's just really nice. And uh, uh, I'm honored to be able to put the book out there. I mean, I hope that, you know, ordinary people love it. And I hope that people who really know a lot about bourbon both love it and see their own passion reflected in it, you know, and yeah, feel a little bit like it's about them, you know. I think that anybody can read this book. I think it's uh, it's a great narrative. You, I learned a lot about you in it, and I learned uh, I learned some things about Julian. Um, I did not know, and and you know him very well. You and I know say. him very well. Yeah, so I've known I've known Julian for a decade, and I've done a lot of events with him. I've interviewed him a ton of times, and I've probably annoyed the shit out of him over the years. <laughs> Well, not as much as I have. So if, if <laughs> like, believe me, I, I think he never wants to see me coming again. <laughs> well, <laughs> what we should do is we should, we should uh, link up together and knock on his door, you know, one night and he'll be like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> no, the greatest practical joke ever would be if we got every single whiskey writer in America on a bus and drove them to his house and, and nine o'clock at night, we just knock on the door and every, his whole front yard is filled with people. Oh my God, he would so come out with his shotgun. Oh no, like you know how some people would think that was funny. He would not think that was funny. No, he would not. We should a hundred percent do it I, because I he would it. lose his shit. Sissy would think it was great. 
I, I've got just the uh, I got just the crew. I got just that's the crew. perfect. That's perfect. Well, right. Thanks so much for joining. Tell everybody again how they can find the book, uh, and tell us one more time uh, about the raffle coming up. So uh, the book is called Pappy Land. You get it wherever you get books. Uh, Amazon. There are links uh, on my website, writethompson.com, that will point you to uh, independent bookstores like Square Books or whatever the one closest to you is. Uh, we have three raffle events coming up. Uh, there's information. It's all over social media. It's also on my website as well, the dates and how to buy a raffle ticket. And three events, three bottles of uh, Van Winkle apiece, including 15 and 20-year-old. And for 50 bucks, you get a shot at winning you make a donation to the Lee Initiative Restaurant Workers Fund. You get a signed copy of the book, and there's a Q&A with Julian and I uh, answering anything you want to ask about his whiskey or uh, about his grandfather uh, or about what whiskeys he likes and doesn't like and why. And uh, then you can ask me to tell embarrassing stories about him, which I'll do, and that'll be really funny. Love it. And, and of course, uh, with Julian, uh, he loves talking about Stitzel Weller. Is you know, and uh, I loves think it. He loves talking about that. So if you get an opportunity to ask him about a favorite Stitzel Weller moment, or when did Stitzel Weller run out, and the Pappy line, you know that sort of thing, I think you'll find that he'll be very uh, excited, and he is transparent. So you'll get a you'll get an opportunity to see what Julian is like if you are asking the questions, and you get to play, you get to be us for a minute, ask uh, ask Julian a question, and then maybe yeah. you could, and then maybe you can join us on that bus and. Uh, exactly. Stand in his yard. Stand in his yard with us. So that, that that'll be fun on down the road. But uh, right. I just want to thank you so much for coming on. It's great to see you. I look forward to, you know, hanging out in person again one day and uh, sipping a little uh, bourbon together. So and I know you've got a lot of things coming up like you're going to the Masters, right? I am going to the Masters. Uh, I'm actually uh, I'm going to be over there first, November 1st and 2nd recording those things that air during the masters. And then I'll be back. Uh, it's going to be really weird to be I the see. only, like, I mean, there's a small group of people who are going to be there. Yeah. I got to imagine the masters in November, just going to be weird. It's going to be, it's going to be really, really weird. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, at the, by the time of the events, I'll have been there. So if you have any questions about what the golf course looks like, I can give you a sneak preview. And that's 2020 for you, folks. You get more uh, more information on a uh, in a whiskey community uh, than you do a, a live golfing tournament. So, uh, all right, my friend, uh, I appreciate you coming on. It's great seeing you. And yeah. everybody, go buy Pappy Land if you haven't already. Go to Square Books and sign up for that. This is a book you do not want to miss. Cheers, my friend. Thank you so much.